resurrection song. This is my hallelujah call. This is why it's to you I run. There's no space that is love can't reach. There's no place that we can't find peace. There's no end to amazing grace. I am holding on to you. I am holding on to you. In the middle of the storm, I am holding on. I am holding on to you. I am holding on to you. In the middle of the storm, I am holding on. I am. In the middle of the storm, I am holding on. I am. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are amazing. And you lift us up and you make us feel full here today, Lord. And thank you for making me imperfect. I appreciate that. So I can just continue to go out there and worship with you. Lord, um, just allow today be amazing. Amen. Y'all may be seated.
Amen. Uh, so I am a firm believer <clears throat> that oftentimes God uses us to be an answer to someone else's prayers. Uh, I've seen that numerous times in my life, uh, both being the person that God has used um, and been the recipient of God using other people to answer uh, my prayers. Uh, we know scripture is filled with times that people have poured out to God in prayer and God is chosen to answer by sending somebody else. Even when they don't feel worthy, even when they don't feel like they can do it, God chooses to use that person. Um, and also, when I preach, I am rarely the heroes of my own stories. Uh, I'm usually the butt of the joke. I'm usually the one that gets it wrong. Uh, but I am going to use myself as an example of what to do right um, in a moment. Uh, uh, my family told me that I'm not supposed to do that, and they quoted, quoted scripture to me, but um, I have the microphone, and they don't, so I get to do this. Uh, so this past week, I um, went to a store, and I walked up to the checkout, and there were two lines, and one was short, and the cashier was grumpy. And then the other, the long was line, wait, the line was long, yeah, the long was line, and the cashier looked happy. And I was like, well, I'm in a hurry, so I'm going to go to the short, grumpy line. Um, and so I went in that line, and sure enough, this cashier was just grumpy. Like, not mean, just short and grumpy to everybody. And when it was my turn, I got up, and they rang the two things, and they, you know, asked how I was doing, as they're contractually obligated to say, as part of the, you know, experience. And then I waited until, you, you know, you put your chip in, and you have to wait for it to, like, magically do the money thing. And I looked at them, this is the perfect time to do it. You look at the cashier and you say, so how are you today? Because you have nothing to do during that like couple seconds there. And so I looked them in the eye and I said, how are you doing today? And the cashier went, what? <laughs> and so I put on my smiliest face that I could. And I said, I'm just asking, how are you doing today? How is it? And they melted. Their grumpiness melted. And she looked at me and she said, oh, Poppy, that's so nice. And I was like, oh, she called me Poppy. <laughs> and we talked for a little bit as the thing was going on. And, and she shared what was going on in her life. And, and uh, then as I was leaving, she grabbed my hand and she said, I love that you did that. You have a great day. And so just that little interaction is a way that we can pour God's love into the world. This happened earlier in the week. I was ready to share it. I knew that I was going to do it. And then something happened last night. Last night, I, I drove to the ATM, and I, I went to get cash out uh, for offering because I have to do cash. Otherwise, I forget how to write a check. And uh, you don't want to bounce a check to the church. That'd be awkward, especially as the pastor. So I just do cash. It's just helpful for me. And so as I was waiting for it to like, count the money, I was tired, and I leaned against the, the window and I looked down, and there was money on the ground in front of the drive-up ATM. And not just a little bit. There was a lot of it. There was a stack of money there. And so I finished what I was doing. I got my money. And then I pulled forward and got out. And I started picking up $20 bills. And I was counting as I was picking up these $20 bills. And I counted 51 of them, which is over $1,000. And so clearly... Because earlier in the week, I had brought joy to this woman. God was rewarding me. I don't know why y'all are laughing. I mean, that's how, this, that's how this works, right? And so I looked on the ATM, and there was no, like, 1-800-I-found-money number there. Uh, and so I called. Uh, I didn't even know, like, who to call, because Trinity is not a real city. Um, and so I called Newport Ritchie, and they sent me to the sheriff's office, and I talked to them on the phone, and uh, a, a deputy came out, and I was able to hand the money over, uh, and the deputy said, that is really honest with you. Like, I can't believe you wanted to do this. And I was like, oh, I didn't want to. No, no, no. <laughs> do you realize the number of Legos I could buy with this? And, and the guy at the end of it, he said, he said, we got a call earlier today about somebody that lost uh, money here, which I'm not entirely sure how all of that worked with it just neatly, neatly stacked in front of it. 
He said, well, we got a call earlier about somebody that lost their money and, and you know, there wasn't anything we could do. And I'm like, dude, you definitely answered somebody's prayers tonight. And I was like, fine. Like, <laughs> so it reminded me that like, not always when we want to be an answer to someone else's prayers, that we are, that we get to be an answer to someone's prayers. Um, would you join me in prayer? Gracious God, we ask that you would open our eyes and soften our hearts to ways you are calling us to be the answer for someone else's prayers. For ways that you are wanting to work in and through, and if we're honest, sometimes despite us, to answer someone else's prayers. God, we're humbled and amazed that you choose to use us. And so, God, we pray that you would continue to use us. We pray that we would take serious the prayer that we're about to say, this prayer of bringing your kingdom here on earth as it is to heaven. Remind us that we are to be your kingdom builders. We are to actively work to bring about the kingdom of heaven everywhere we go. With everything we do, we are to sow your seeds of love and grace and forgiveness. To God, we offer this prayer humbly in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At the end of the, my story about getting money, uh, at the first service, somebody said, oh, you were going to put that on the offering plate? And I was like, oh, yeah, definitely. That's what I was thinking of doing. Um, yeah, so we are uh, continuing in a sermon series that we started a few weeks ago on having faith like a child. Uh, which, by the way, uh, because of that title, uh, we got our uh, live stream on Facebook shut down uh, due to adult content. Um, so we had to rename it on Facebook, and I think we're live again. Um, but that's really funny that that happened uh, this morning. So anyway, uh, but we're looking at what does it mean to have faith like a child? The Gospels of Matthew and Luke tell us, Jesus tells us to have faith like a child. But our society says to not be childish in anything. You need to grow up, act your age, be a good little gentleman or good little lady. We, we tell people we value growing up. And so we've made a distinction between being childish and childlike. Let me give you an, a real world example. If you go to any sporting event for kids, the kids on the field are being childlike. The adults in the stands are being childish. Oh, that hit a little close to home for some of us. So childlike is maintaining those attitudes, those characteristics, those personality traits that kids have that are wonderful. Being childish is being immature. We don't want to be immature in our faith. So we're looking at different personality traits and characteristics that kids have. The first week we looked at kids ask tons of questions. Why, 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 why? And we saw that asking questions, Moses argue with God for chapter on chapter about why he shouldn't be the person that helped deliver the Israelites from captivity. It's not asking questions or wrestling, but rather it's silence that is toxic to our faith. Half the Psalms are um, David having a pity party, and God's big enough to handle our little temper tantrums. And so it's okay to wrestle and question and doubt and be confused, but it's not okay to walk away from our faith. And the next week, we learn that kids trust fully. If you're a dad, oftentimes you make up things to tell your kids so that they stop asking questions, and that's not good. Don't do that. But kids trust fully what you tell them. And we should trust fully the things that we read in Scripture, that God loves us, that we are created in God's image, that we are to be the image of God, the image bearer out in our communities. The week after that was dream big. That was a great week. 
We learn that, that kids have big dreams. Kids want to be, when I grow up, I want to be an astronaut cowboy. That's amazing. Adults have lame dreams. I want to claw my way to middle management. And so I preached a sermon about dreaming big. What, what can you dream big? And we talked about the, the, the missions group here at the church that feeds people like 9,000 meals a day, like 15 days per week. There's so much stuff that they do that it started smaller. So start with your dream. God has a big dream, and you don't have to do all of it. God fills in the blanks. So where's your dream starting? And it was wonderful. Uh, since then, I've had people come to me and say, I struggled with infertility, and if there's somebody in the church that is doing, going through that, I'd be happy to walk with them. People said, I, 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 I used to be a teacher. I used to tutor. We've got two schools across the street. If, if there's any kind of thing that y'all want to offer here, I'd, I'd love to be part of that. I don't want to lead it, but I'd love to be part of that. I've had people come to me and say, you, we got this big field out here. I wonder if we did like Stations of the Cross or, or something around Easter, like outside. I wonder what that would look like. Again, I don't want to lead it, but I want to be part of it. These dreams that people are having and, and where is God speaking to us? What can we do with them? Last week, we talked about how kids are unashamed. Kids know who they are. Kids don't wear masks other than like pretend and dress up, but kids don't pretend like they're something else. But we as adults often define ourselves by other things rather than defining ourselves as I'm a child of God. I mess up sometimes, but I'm actively following God. Kids are unashamed. This week, we, we go to the next thing that I came up with and that kids play hard. Kids play so hard. They have huge imaginations. Any uh, parent of a toddler or an infant will tell you that kids will play more with the box the toy came in than the toy itself. You give kids a cardboard box and markers and maybe scissors if you trust them enough, and they will entertain themselves for hours. As a pastor's family, we move around a lot, and so every time we move, we save all the boxes, and the kids get to play for a couple weeks. We've had, like, movie theaters with, like, working um, snack drawers. We've had, like, fans hooked up and a place to hang an iPad to watch something. We've had, like, two-story, not that I could get in, but, like, two-story box forts. Fun things that kids play with. It's not just inside that kids play with things. Kids play hard outside. You go to a theme park with a kid, and they will run you ragged. You cannot keep up with them. They're go, 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 go. And then at the end, they crash. But we'll talk about that later. Kids play outside, and they're filled with energy. They're red in the face. One of our kids would play so hard during the day that at dinner time they would fall asleep in their mashed potatoes. There's so many funny videos of kids falling asleep at the dinner table. Kids go, 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 and then they stop. Our scripture for this morning tells us that we are supposed to play. Kids view their world as their playground, and unfortunately, sometimes that means that the couch and the chair and other furniture becomes jungle gyms for them. Our scripture for this morning is Ecclesiastes 8.15. If you're with us on Christmas Day, it's the one I preached on then. So I recommend having fun, because there's nothing better for people in this world than to eat, drink, and enjoy life. That way, they will experience some happiness along with all the hard work God gives them under the sun. God wants us to enjoy our life. And enjoying life and the world around us is something that adults honestly have a hard time doing. We look at all of the responsibilities we have. We, we look at the jobs we go to, the cleaning around the house, the committees that we sit on the chauffeuring our kids around to school or activities or any number of other things that we sometimes forget to enjoy the world around us. And unfortunately, some people seem to think that Christians are not supposed to enjoy the world. Some people think that Christians are the fun police. And oftentimes I, I would agree with them. But Christians, we try to be the fun police. We, we take our faith too serious. Yeah, I know it's weird to hear a pastor telling you you're taking your faith too serious. But we might be. We don't need to sit in our rooms and read our Bible 23 hours a day. 
We need to get out and enjoy the world around us. God gave us a world to play in, gave us bodies to play with, and yet we don't go play. We don't enjoy the creation that God has given us. Some people imagine God as this like cruel taskmaster that is opposed to any fun or pleasure. They think there's some scripture verse like second hesitations four five. Thou shalt not have any jolly fun of any kind at any point of your life. There isn't a second hesitation. So there's not even a first one. Like it's just not there. We're supposed to enjoy our lives. We're supposed to have fun. God created us with the ability to experience joy and pleasure and delight. We were designed that way. Let me say that again. God created us with the ability to experience joy. Several scriptures are filled with descriptions of pleasure and delight. Many of the Psalms and Proverbs deal with enjoyment, the the beauty of creation, the diversity of humanity around us shows us that God's creative palette is alive and well. Many people find pleasure spending time outdoors. It's no wonder why many people have a religious experience at the Grand Canyon or sitting on a porch in the mountains or watching the sun set at the beach, floating down a river. All of these ways that we get out and enjoy the creation that God has designed for us. In the book of Genesis, God tells us that we are tasked to watch over the world. And part of watching over the world is enjoying it. So get outside and enjoy it. I mean, look at the diversity of animals around us. And that points to God's creativity. All the different kinds of birds and the songs that they sing. Look at animals themselves. Like fish are weird looking. And they're beautiful. Look at the creativity that God must have had at the end of creation and kind of bored and was like, well, I got this deer. Maybe I should throw some spots on it and like stretch its neck. We'll call it a giraffe. God had some leftover pieces and was like, what am I going to do with this? Well, I'll take this body and like give it a beaver tail. And oh, I got this leftover duck bill. I don't know what to do with it. Oh, I'll really mess with him. I'll make it a mammal and it will lay eggs. We'll call it a duck bill platypus. It's gorgeous. The creativity that God has. And look at us. I'm so glad that nobody, not everybody looks like me. Yeah, you are too. I'm glad that not everybody looks the same. I'm glad that we all have different things that we find appealing, different things that we find attractive in others. I love the diversity out there. We need to embrace that. And celebrate the ways that we can enjoy creation. It isn't just being outdoors or enjoying nature that God has given us, but it's also relating to those of different personalities. I told you last week about my friend Deanna, how she goofy dances to worship music. And I love having conversations with her. We had a friend in college that never spoke at all. We called him Silent Bob. His name wasn't Bob, but he never said anything. And then when he did, it was profound, like that character from those movies. Which was nice, because I'd never stopped talking. And so we got along really well. (laughs) We have different people around us. John Wesley, our our reluctant founder of the United Methodist Church, he he would travel around. and, And one of the things he did is he never went to, like, opera houses or playhouses. and They didn't have movies back then. But, like, he didn't do anything fun back then. But he would go to a tea house wherever he went. He'd show up at a coffee shop, and he would talk to people, which now might get you, like, arrested if you just, like, went and sat and started talking to somebody. But I love that idea of just sitting and being in someone's presence, having a conversation with someone, getting to know them. You have to be approachable in your demeanor, and I sometimes look grumpy. That's why my eyebrows are always up on Sunday morning and why I'm always smiling so much because my natural resting face is an angry little dwarf. (laughs) Welcome to church. I'm your pastor. (laughs) Hi, I'm so glad you're here. But Wesley would would interact with people and have conversations and, and get to know people. And I wonder if I know that I certainly need to do that better with my neighbors. 
There was a time that you knew everybody, the two on each side of you, the three across from you, those behind you, especially if you're like Frisbee went into their yard, you had to know who they were to go get it back from them. But now we don't know everyone. Get out, talk to people, have conversations, have community with one another. Years ago when we were living in Texas and a hurricane, Ike came through and knocked out power for two weeks. The news reported that losing power, one of the benefits of that is that neighborhoods got to know each other once again because it was too hot to be inside. And so everybody was outside and everybody was cooking and everybody had food that was about to go bad. I'm like, hey, I've got an entire brisket that I got to cook. Does anybody want some? Like anybody's going to ever say no to brisket. I've got all of this that I could give away. And, and, and neighbors and communities came together and shared with each other. There's beauty. God wants us to emulate kids having conversations on playgrounds, walking up. Hi, I'm Kevin. Do you want to be my best friend and play together? And so we, we should emulate that and have conversations and get to know people. This is good and proper. God, God wants us to be enjoyed. But it isn't just people, it's, it's also joy in things. In Scripture, we see that God himself takes pleasure in things. Zephaniah 3.17, for example, says that God delights in us and sings over us. God delights in us and sings over us. I mean, think about that. When we sing, when we pray, when we glorify God, that brings enjoyment to God. It's beautiful. I love it. Throughout Scripture, there's, there's all kinds of festivals and feasts and, and ceremonial times. And, and part of that was instruction and certain things, but it also was, it's a party. Come hang out and party with us. Come be together. Come be part of this gathering. Yesterday, we, we had our, our church picnic, and, and I worked really hard not to overcomplicate it. I wanted it to just be a picnic, just show up and hang out. And I remember the staff and I, we were talking about like, what do we have to do to set up for it? I was like, nothing, don't. Like we have to have drinks out there, but like don't set up tables in here. Don't just let people show up. I don't want an agenda. Just come and be together. And it was beautiful seeing people talk with one another. I'll, I'll come back to that during my offering time. God wants us to be in community with one another. John 10.10 10 says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I, this is Jesus talking, I have come that you may have life and have life to the full. I don't know about you, but life to the full, to me, sounds a lot like a joyful experience. God wants us to enjoy our lives. I mean, just look at the way the human body was designed. God designed the human body to reveal joy was part of the plan. Taste buds. And other sensory organs tell us that God is not opposed to pleasure. Why does a hamburger taste so good? Why does a hamburger taste so good when you get sharp cheddar cheese and put on top of it, and then bacon, and then like crispy onions, and like barbecue sauce on a brioche bun? Yeah, why does that taste so dang good if God doesn't want us to enjoy life? Why? Now I want one. Why does a back massage feel so good? Why is it that no matter how old I get, when I lean against my mommy, it feels like home? Why? Because God designed us for pleasure. Why is it that a rose smells so good? Why is it that a sunset brings people to tears? Why is it that if I go and sit underneath an oak tree and the Spanish moss is blowing in the breeze, I've died and gone to heaven? Because God designed us to enjoy life. And for some reason, we don't. Some reason, we, we think that we're not supposed to enjoy stuff. Or we think, well, well, as a good Christian, I'm supposed to take enjoyment in reading Scripture. Now, yes, you should. But also, you should get annoyed at reading Scripture. I've said numerous times, if reading this book doesn't mess you up, 
you're doing it wrong. These sacred scriptures are written, and we're called to bring comfort to the afflicted. And to afflict the comforted. It's not nice and pleasurable when we get afflicted. When I read things and I'm like, oh, I don't want to work on that. We don't have to read our Bible 20-something hours a day. We don't have to think of Christianity finding joy just in God. Yes, we do. And we find joy in the other things that God has created for us to enjoy. Now, America, unfortunately, has a really hard time doing this. And it's it's not completely our fault. It's not completely our fault that that, that we are uh, over-infatuated with denying ourselves pleasure and joy. I mean, we were founded by the Puritans. The Puritans, what what they did is they tried to take out all earthly joy and pleasure and only focus on spiritual joy, as if you can separate those. You can't. They sought to live a life so devoted to God that nothing, nothing, nothing at all could ever give them pleasure or joy except from God. Augustine, great guy, love him. He was wrong. When he confessed in one of his journals uh, his sinfulness in enjoying his food too much. Now, I'm not talking about overindulgence. I'm not talking about any of that. But, like, he ate a hamburger and was like, this tastes too good. You shut your mouth, Augustine. That is beautiful. (laughs) He went on to say that, that, that he even admitted guilt in enjoying church music too much. Yeah, I know. Enjoying church music too much. And he said that he felt distracted by the beauty of nature, as if God isn't the one that created that. Self, such meticulous self-denial, it it can seem almost comical to us today. There's nothing sinful about enjoying a song or a hymn. The Ten Commandments don't require bland cooking. That's your upbringing. Surely such self-denial is too extreme perhaps even legalistic. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying the taste of food or beauty or nature or even church music. I wonder if today we might think of how does that affect us at church? Often, I, this is a gross m- misunderstanding, but or whatever, reduction. I think in church that most people fall into two categories, the gluttons and the martyrs. The gluttons just show up and gimme, 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 and they never do anything to serve. The martyrs are only here to serve and will not give up control to anyone else. Now, I have to lead this. I have to be in charge of that. I have to do this because somebody has to do it. Well, let one of the gluttons do it. Well, they won't do it. Well, no, they want to do it, but they just won't do it your way. So let go and let them figure it out. So if you're a martyr, stop it. If you're a glutton, start doing stuff. If you're in the middle, God bless you. (laughs) And so in, in that vein, we have to distinguish between the different kinds of pleasure that are out there. Joy is not a sin. Joy is a choice that we make, but overindulgence is a sin. We live in a broken and messed up world and fallen things and where God's best is often perverted. Just because society deems an activity as pleasurable does not mean it's pleasing to God. In fact, Scripture is filled with examples of this. When we look at the world and we consider the pleasures of the world, the new shiny clothes and fancy cars, we find that they are in fact not healthy for us. Or conducive of a long-term enjoyment. Just ask anybody that's been addicted to anything in their lives. It started off joy. It started off exciting and fun. And then it became too much. It became overwhelming. It became more than they could handle. The prodigal son revealed and reveled in sin until the money ran out. And then he found that the pleasures of sin are fleeting. We know the damaging effects of overindulgence. This is one area that kids don't have the right idea. 
We as adults, were a little bit better about this. We, we understand overindulgence and how it gets us in trouble. We understand that late night on Thanksgiving, and we're like, I should not have had that fourth piece of pie. Oh, I'm going to regret that tomorrow morning. But kids, they don't ever get there. Just talk to any kid on Halloween night, and they're so sick, or Easter, or Christmas, or every other holiday that this world has turned into a candy-getting thing. Sorry. <laughs> One of my beautiful, precious children has a habit of eating way too much and then getting sick at night. And so I, I told them one night, all right, you do whatever you want to do. I don't want to hear about it. Like, you know what's going to happen, and I don't want to hear. And so later that night, I heard them in the bathroom, you know. And then I go up, and I see them, and they're walking out. I'm like, you okay? You told me not to tell you. <laughs> all right, well, I love you, and, you know. Overindulgence is a sermon for another day. The sermon for today is go out and enjoy the things around you. Go out and see the things that are happening. We joked about the kid falling asleep and the mashed potatoes at dinner. We, we joked about how the, the kids will run all day at the theme park and then the parent has to carry them home. There was a great video of a dad training for Disney, and it was a bunch of different clips of him on a treadmill holding the kids in different ways, like one kid or two kids or up on the shoulders or... Yeah, my favorite is you just like grab the overalls, like one on each side and carry them. <laughs> Overindulgence is not what we're talking about, but what are ways that you need to get out and enjoy the world around you? God is not opposed to pleasure. God is opposed to that pleasure usurping his place in our lives. Sometimes we're called to forego the pleasure of the moment so that we can invest in a greater pleasure of God's kingdom. I had to forgo the pleasure of that windfall that I found last night and the Legos that I could have bought in order to be an answer to that person's prayers. Parents often will give up their own pleasure and enjoyment so that kids can enjoy themselves. One of my kids asked me, uh, I, I, I don't remember what it was, but I said no to something, and they said, are you saying no because you really don't want to, or are you saying no because as a dad you have to? And they were old enough at the time to figure it out. And I said, I'm saying no as a dad because I have to. And they said, well, you can have my turn. Get in there. You need to have fun too. And it was hard to say yes. We're designed for enjoyment and pleasure and fun. Learning to enjoy the things around us. Learning to enjoy the people around us. Learning to enjoy all that God has created for us. Something we can learn from kids. There's a saying that uh, nobody ends their life and says, oh, I wish I had worked just a little bit more. Most people end their lives saying, I wish I would have spent time with my family or spent time doing the things that I enjoy. Working hard, providing for your family, being for your family is important, but so is play. So I'm going to end you or uh, leave you with this question. What part of God's creation do you enjoy the most? Or maybe to say it a different way, what part of God's creation is your soul longing to enjoy this week? And how can you do that? Is it people? Is it smells? Is it places? Is it food? Where can you go and enjoy? I spent five summers working at the summer camp in Leesburg, and uh, the last three, I was waterfront director, and I was in charge of all the canoes and sailboats. And any time a storm blew up, we had to, every lifeguard ran down to the waterfront and helped break down the sailboats. Uh, the, the camp is on an island, and the camp is in a cove, and so storms would blow up out of nowhere. And we all knew that when the lake turned neon green, it's a weird thing, but the lake turns neon green, that all the lifeguards would sprint to the boat basin. And so I'm running down there, and uh, Patrick was in front of me. You know Patrick, that guy, that person, got on my nerves. Beautiful, wonderful creature of God, just not my friend. So we're going down there, and Patrick is in front of me, and we get to the bank. We're about to go down the hill, and mm, Patrick stops in front of me, almost run into him. He puts his arms up and looks at the sky, 
as the storm is blowing in and we don't have time for this shenanery. <laughs> and he looks up at the sky and he says, how can they deny your power? And I went, oh. <laughs> in the middle of the storm and us rushing to get the boats broken down, Patrick was so in awe of his God that he stopped to worship. <sighs> Fine. <laughs> I grew up in Lakeland, where it's the, uh, la it's the um, lightning capital of the U.S. Uh, other than the a little part of the Savannah in Africa, it's the lightning capital of the world. Uh, it's because the, the one breeze turns into the other breeze, and they meet over the middle of the state, and there's thunderstorms. A um, little meteorological lesson for you. Uh, and, and I grew up with thunderstorms. I loved it. And then we moved to Texas, and they didn't have them. We moved to Gainesville, and they didn't have them. We moved to Hollywood, South Florida, and they didn't have them. We got back here, and the first thunderstorm that happened, I was standing just watching it rain, watching the lightning go across, hearing the thunder rumble, like rumbling in my soul, shaking the windows, and I was so happy the cats were not, but I was so happy. That is a worshipful moment for me. So I wonder, church, where can you enjoy God's creation this week? The last night that Jesus was with his disciples, they gathered in an upper room and they had a meal together. A meal. They shared food with one another. In the midst of that meal, as they were talking with one another, I, I imagine the hours go by and good conversations and funny conversations, heartwarming conversations and hard conversations are happening. In the midst of being together and sharing in this meal, Jesus took the bread. He gave thanks to God and he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat from this all of you. This is my body. My body that is broken for you, eat this in remembrance of me every time you gather. And likewise, when the supper was over, he took the cup. Again, giving thanks to God, he gave it to the disciples and said, Take and drink from this, all of you. This is my blood. The blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Gracious God, I ask that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here. In these gifts of bread and juice, make them be for us your body and your blood. That as we consume them, as we participate in this meal, we might be a redeemed people. Empowered to go forth into all of your creation and clearly demonstrate the love of Christ. Amen. All right, this is not my table or the United Methodist table. This is God's table. And so what that means is that all are welcome and invited to participate in this meal. All that we ask is that you truly and earnestly repent of your sin and you seek to live a life in a relationship with Christ. What that means is I might not know exactly what's happening, but I want to be part of this community that goes out and enjoys the world. Uh, and right now, I'm going to invite those that are assisting and serving to come up. Uh, I'm going to serve the musicians first, um, and then we're going to serve everybody else, and then the servers um, are going to serve um, ourselves. It's a little different, but we're going to try. Oh, hold on. Can you hold this for a second? All right, so we're going to have a couple stations available at the front. You're going to walk up and receive a piece of bread in your hand and dip it in the juice. Uh, you can stop and kneel at the altar rail to pray, or you can go back to your seats uh, and pray. Uh, we're not going to have any ushers. Uh, we're just going to invite you to come up as you feel led. Uh, so won't you come?
Say, take this bread, take this wine, now the simple may divine for many to receive. By your mercy we come to your table, by your grace to our making us Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you for the gift that you have given us. We pray that as we go about our lives, we might take your gift of love and grace and mercy out into all the world. 
so that the world will know of your goodness, of your grace, and of your love. Amen. So yesterday, uh, we had our church picnic. Uh, it was a great day, um, other than the wind. Uh, it was a great day to be here. Uh, one of the things that I loved is watching kids play with other adults, uh, adults that don't belong to them. Um, and, and, and the reason that I love that is that uh, I think I've shared with you a few years ago, I went to a, a, a church conference and it talked about in, in children's and youth ministry, we often hear this one to five ratio. You have one adult for every five kids. And they said, wouldn't it be great if we could flip that around? Wouldn't it be great if for every one kid at your church, they could point to five adults that were mentors, that were safe people, that were those that they could go and talk to you? As much as I would love for my kids to be able to come talk to me about anything going on, I recognize that they might not want to. And so I think it would be great if I could point to five people around this church that they could talk to. And so as we were having the church picnic yesterday, and I noticed kids playing football with people that didn't belong to them, it warmed my heart. As I uh, see my, one of my kiddos come and play music on Tuesday nights and rehearsal and Sunday mornings, I hope that some, well, yeah, some of the adults are, you know, positive influences on them. Um, you know, as we, as we see events and kids being with others, we, we hope that they're forming those bonds. When we were setting up for Pumpkin Patch, my kids went off and were learning from other people. And I loved that. And so my message to you is that if we're having an event, come. Rarely we will say this is an event just for a certain demographic. But if it's an event, come. Come be part of it. If it's an event just for older people to do stuff, come and bring your kids. Let them get in the way. Let them learn what it means to hang lights or trim trees or pack packs or whatever we're doing. If we have an event that is mainly for young families, come and volunteer. Be the person that fills the cups with ice. Be the person that walks around and helps with crafts. Be the person that is there and is smiling and is present and fun. Just come and do stuff. As the ushers come forward and begin to pass the baskets, as the ushers come forward and begin to pass the baskets, let me remind you that we here at Hope United Methodist Church do not view offering as a fundraiser or a way that you, hold on, buddy, give, uh, give to the church, but rather a way that we give as the church, a way that we pool our resources together so that we are better equipped to go out into our community and around the world and offer hope. Bring forward these gifts today. Can we please bow our heads in prayer? Lord, we are thankful for every gift you provide us each and every day. And help us 
to give some of those gifts back to you. We want to give our first and best gift always to you, Lord, to use it for your service. And we just ask that you would help us to, re to look for those places where we can be an answer to someone else's prayer through the gifts that you've given us. We pray this in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you. So can you please stand with us as we sing one more time, I am to bring our worship to a close. Chairs on this side, please. Uh, so we're going to stack them 10 high. There's some rolly cart thingies over there that we'll bring over, so don't run away too quickly. Uh, receive now this benediction. May the love of God the Father Almighty, the friendship of Jesus Christ the Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always as you go play hard. Amen. Fun. Second chairs. <laughs> For the joy of 